In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to this edition of The Extra Podcast. Today we're talking to Carol Johnson-Dean, president of Lemoyne Owen College, to talk about the $40 million gift that the college recently received and the impact it will have on the school, the students, and the community. Carol, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Eric. So the, the, talk about what the gift means in, in, it, in its most you know, specific way, but also the, the, just the broader impact that it will have. So this is the largest gift um, that the college has ever received in its 158 year history. So that in and of itself is so significant because it, it is such a significant number above what we have had. Um, and um, when I think about our current endowment uh, back in March, uh, kind of before the pandemic, we were at about $15 million in terms of our endowment. And that compares obviously to colleges and universities you know, even in our area that are substantially higher, um, over 300 million, for example, at Rhodes. And so um, not negative about that, just the fact that the historically black colleges have not had alums who've been able to give a huge amount of money to create large endowments. And many of our alums have gone into social service or education related fields. Um, at any rate, um, so this is the largest beneficial gift in the school's 158-year history, and it's really a statement by the Community Foundation of Greater Memphis about the importance of Lemoyne Owen College and its legacy here in the Memphis area, and also the opportunity it affords, particularly African-American students. We are the only historically black college in uh, Memphis, uh, having opened our doors in 1862 originally uh, as a school that was opened by the American Missionary Association to uh, educate uh, uh, freedmen and um, runaway slaves. And so um, it has a long history. And then it, um, you know, became a four-year college. And then, obviously, the University of Memphis um, integrated, or Memphis State at the time, integrated its uh, campus in uh, 1959, but up until that point, uh, really for Memphis and the greater Memphis area, uh, black students only had the option of a school like uh, Lemoyne Owen College, particularly in this region of the country. And and I often say that it's a, a significant a gift as the first $20,000 that was given by Dr. Julius Lemoyne. He was a physician medical doctor in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was also a white abolitionist, and he believed that education was really important uh, to helping the cause of um, uh, eliminating slavery and educating uh, black people. And so he gave $20,000 to the American Missionary Association, and that is what really started the ball rolling. I believe that this gift, this $40 million beneficial gift to the college um, is significant and as significant as that early gift to the birth of the college and to the college's, this gift to the college's rebirth, actually, as we try to transform and move the college forward in its journey uh, for excellence and also increasing equity and opportunity in addressing the many issues and challenges that face uh, the African-American community in particular. The, um, the gift, we'll touch on a, a dig deeper on a lot of that. The, just to, the gift, is it an endowment gift? And it, does that mean it yes. has some, does it have some, so, so it, it can't all be spent. I mean, people maybe not as familiar with this. You know, if it's going into right. the endowment, it's not $40 million that you can or would necessarily even want right. to spend. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not sitting with $40 million <laughs> in, our, in our bank account right now. Right. But there are two aspects of it. One, uh, it establishes an endowment gift, actually, uh, for us in the sense that every January 15th, uh, we get the interest on the endowment, which is projected to be about 
And of course, um, it's a rolling average in a way so that every three years they look at it and, and give us what really is equivalent about $2 million a year, which is a substantial amount of money uh, to help us with a number of the challenges that we face. And so I guess I would say that um, it, it, it's a tremendous gift. It's, it, it is also a tremendous gift in this way. It, um, it's un, it's, we, it, we are allowed to have it in an unrestricted way, right? So um, the funds can be used for whatever purposes that are determined by Lamorne or in college. So the money will be distributed annually in an amount equal to 5%, really into perpetuity. So as long as the college exists, it will receive these funds. And then secondly, the college, along with the Board of Trustees and the President, are allowed to designate the fund, funds to use to be for, it could be used all to me for scholarships. It could be used all for uh, operational costs. So yeah. that's huge because it, the college is not tied to using it solely for one purpose or another. The right. uh, an example would be the funds that uh, were donated by the next Netflix uh, executives to uh, both, I think, Spelman College and Morehouse College in Atlanta are dollars that they were given, but solely to be used for scholarship. Right. And so right. this gift is even more powerful because it gives a lot of power to the institution, to the board of trustees, to determine what are the best ways in which to use those dollars. And I'm sure a lot of the money will be spent for scholarships, but it also recognizes that there may, may be innovative programs or there may be innovative um, opportunities that the college might want to uh, address. Uh, and, yeah. it, and then the college is given that freedom and flexibility, which is a huge, um, you know, unrestricted use of the funds. Uh, for any purpose that the college determines that's in line with their mission, obviously, the mission of the right. college. It, it, the, just for perspective, the operating budget, the annual operating budget for Lemoyne is what? It's about, a, uh, well, if you think of it as about about $16 million. So really it's one-eighth the annual yeah. of the annual budget. It's huge. Uh, is a huge amount. We have about yeah. 800 students on our campus, and um, – you know, about, let's say, 300 of them live on the campus, and the others are generally speaking from the Memphis area. So when you think about one-eighth of our budget uh, being generated in this way, and then it being also unrestricted, it's really a phenomenal uh, and powerful yeah. gift to the college. How, how was, was this a... Um... This was announced, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, obviously, uh, which is what, partly why yeah. we have you on the phone instead of uh, uh, on studio quality here because we had technical issues with Zoom. We don't have video this week because we've been doing this with video. Nonetheless, we're very happy to have you here by phone. But um, <laughs> this was done, the, the gift was made and, or announced, you know, in, in the midst of the pandemic and on the heels of, our, you know, the, the, the killing of George Floyd and a kind of national conversation and national protest, national awakening uh, or, or I don't know, um, bro more broadly awakened um, uh, conversation about racial uh, inequality. Was this a reaction to that, or had this been in the works? Well, I think that there are two things. One, I think Lemoyne has been, Lemoyne Owen College has been reexamining its place and its vision and its work and trying to figure out what changes we need to make to be more a uh, part of the Memphis community and being in partnership with the Memphis community. So it's uh, like, it's important for our students to get an academic education, but it's also really important for our students to be connected to the challenges, the inequalities and the aspirations that the people in this community have for their children. A lot of our students are first generation college goers. So navigating college is requires a lot more wraparound um, services that we provide routinely to students to help them navigate college, to understand college, but also asking ourselves, how do we become more relevant to both the economy of Memphis, the businesses, and, and make sure that our business community sees us as tools and as people who can contribute to the economy and the well-being of, of the community. At the same time, I think um, as I understand it from Bob Bacher, who heads up the Community Foundation, the um, Community Foundation have been also 
looking at their strategy for uh, using philanthropy to uh, drive uh, and strengthen the community. And um, the, the endowment at the uh, foundation certainly has grown under Bob Fox's leadership from about $200 million to over $800 million. And so he's provided tremendous leadership to the Community Foundation. And along with the chair, uh, Terry Freeman, from the um, National Civil Rights Museum, who chairs their board, they have been really looking and examining, and they had come up with a new plan of action back in April. And all these things, I think, the college is re-examining, the um, foundations re-examining its work and its leadership opportunities, combined with the fact that we had this um, international pandemic and um, the obviously the disparities in healthcare and in education are prominent in looking at uh, the pandemic. And then you had the George Floyd uh, and the emphasis on race and how race and disparities and um, inequality come together in some kind of intersectionality way, I think all combined with the fact that the pandemic has also caused serious economic harm. Um, we lost about 11% of our endowment um, with the pandemic and economic downturn, but we had a lot of families who have students at our college who lost jobs. We had a lot of students who had expected either summer internships or employment who lost uh, opportunities for employment because they used that employment to subsidize their college education costs. So I think it's the combination. I always say the intersectionality between education, healthcare, and uh, employment opportunities and economic well-being that came together and I also think um, in our community, it's a deep belief that Memphis has so much potential that we need to actually take action to make um, some of these things happen that will benefit. Yeah. I really think that um, it came together at a really moment in time. And yeah. I will mention this one other thing. Sure. Um, because Bob Fox said this to me, he said, we probably would not have started out with 40 million. Um, we <laughs> might have come up with a lower number. He said, yeah. but when the Netflix announced their 40 million to spell money, 40 million to more house, I think we thought Memphis can do that too. We have that capacity. So yeah. I was just extraordinarily pleased uh, yeah. to hear him say that yeah. and to have this investment in our college. Uh, just some quick facts. You may have said this earlier. The the um, number of students at Lemoyne. Well, we are about eight hundred students. Okay. Uh, we'd like to be more than a thousand, and we're hoping that uh, this uh, endowment will help to drive both scholarships for talented students and help us to recruit more students to to not only yeah. attend college here but to stay here. Most of our students do come from Memphis, but we have uh, students from from the larger Mid-South area, but also students who come from Kansas City, St. Louis, and Chicago, Little Rock, but also, you know, northern uh, Mississippi, from east, eastern Arkansas, and as far away as California, we have a few students who are international from Africa and some from uh, the Caribbean countries, but most of the students are from the greater Mid-South, greater Memphis area. And, and about what percent of, in normal times, and we're obviously not in normal times when it comes to many things, college life very much included, in normal times, um, how many, what percentage of the students live on campus? Well, I would say about, um, so we have about 800 students and we have dorm capacity for probably 370, let's say. I got you. And so um, close to half of the students live on yeah. campus and then that half probably uh, commute back and forth on a day-to-day -day basis. Last fall, about 90% of our students were eligible for some kind of federal or a HOPE scholarship or state uh, student aid. And so we have a lot of students whose families live, you know, close or near the poverty level. Uh, many of our students are the first in their family to attend college. So college has not been something that's part of their normal tradition, which is why the wraparound services are really uh, so important. And about 95% uh, or more of our students are African-American or Black. And so we really are, uh, you know, a historically Black college 
with all of the sort of normal um, uh, um, in, enrollment. Uh, when I've talked to the United Negro College Fund about the um, uh, demographic profile, uh, they'll say that about 75% uh, uh, of their uh, population of going to uh, historically black colleges are students who are eligible for some kind of Pell grant or some state or federal aid. But about 50% of them are first generation college scores as well across the whole United Negro College Fund of Historically Black College perspective. Uh, so even though our numbers are a little bit higher than that, I think this, I mean, the struggle with both financial enrollment and decisions and choices uh, obviously are true for a lot of historically black colleges. Sometimes people ask me, do we really need historically black colleges anymore? And I uh, often reflect, um, I'm a graduate of a historically black college myself. I went to Fisk University in Nashville, and um, my son went to Morehouse College uh, in, uh, in Atlanta. And, and my mother attended Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee. So wow. I'm sort yeah. of deep myself personally in the historically black college tradition. And, you know, all my graduate work was at the University of Minnesota. I felt like I was well prepared, and I felt like I had lots of opportunity because I attended historically black college. First and foremost, I think, to think of myself as a leader, as a contributor. And I do think that there's this sort of cultural context in the historically black college community where you are told that you have to not just get a job, not just have a career, but that you have a responsibility to address some of the inequalities that exist in our community. And so I would say that the historically black colleges are needed, not just because um, there are still students who are first-generation college goers, but also because some of the persistent challenges of inequality that face the Black community in particular uh, need to have everybody paying attention, so uh, families of all races paying attention, but uh, the leadership of the Black community has to be part of addressing and, and uh, looking at these issues in very specific ways and helping to design a response that can be sustainable and can make significant improvements in our community. Um, I have a, a couple of questions that follow up on that, but let me take a quick uh, break to remind everyone that the Extra Podcast is one of many weekly podcasts we do at the Daily Memphian, including the Behind the Headlines podcast, as well as shows on politics, the uh, one that Bill Drees does, sports, including Grizzlies podcast with the Grizzlies coming back, food with Jennifer Biggs, and more. All of our podcasts are on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, the website itself, or wherever you get your podcast. I was thinking when you 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 know you said, and I, I was going to ask if you get that question: you know, is is the is there still a role for um, historically black uh, colleges? And you you answered that well. And I wonder if there isn't almost um, not a, it's not a question whether there's a need for the, the role you de define, but it's kind of like white people like me need to know more about historically black colleges and universities, right? I mean, the, the, the reverse is more true, that it's not that there's any doubt that, that um, this need is there, but that the need you all deal with, the 50 to 90 percent, when you're talking about Lemoyne being 90 percent students who are first generation college I think you said it was close to that. Uh, 15. Yeah, that's right. That's um, right. College goers. Yeah. It, 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 so yeah, we need to that the, the 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 world outside the historically black colleges needs to know more. It, it's not that you all um, need to break down your walls or something. Right. So I think that um, we have a responsibility too to invite the community in to tell our his, history to explain what we do. Um, we had a college recently visit our campus. This was before the pandemic. It was one of the uh, uh, white colleges. And they brought a group of students to, to our campus. And they talked to students. And I was listening to some of their questions. And some of the students said, why did you choose a, a, a black college? What made you choose? And, I, and I'll never get one of the responses from one of the students who attended you know, a paternally white college before had transferred to us, and she said, I felt like I was lost in a sea of lots of people doing lots of things, but I couldn't find myself. And she said, I transferred to Lemoyne and I found my identity. And here I'm a leader, I'm a participant, I'm on the Royal 
support. I participate in decision making. And it's not that you can't get those things. Where I do think that sometimes some students uh, feel lost and need the kind of nurturing support and help uh, to see themselves as leaders and to imagine that they can be um, contributors in, in just really meaningful ways. Um, I, I also do think that, um, you know, I, I will say this, we don't have very many, but we do have a few white students. <laughs> and uh, uh, some of the students that I've talked to are white, the very few ones that are here have come for baseball or they've come from uh, for our golf team. <laughs> So yeah. uh, I think that uh, people make choices for a variety of reasons about going to college. And uh, yet um, they fit in well. And I think they feel accepted here on the campus. And I think that they have a learning about diversity that is desperately needed uh, for lots of people as we saw when um, the George Floyd uh, incident occurred. Because I think that there are assumptions that people make that uh, drive some of the issues around race. And I would say that uh, all too often we assume that uh, black people, uh, young black men in particular, are guilty before they're proven innocent. And so yeah. when they're stopped, uh, their uh, the assumptions about their um, guilt that uh, permeate the perceptions that people have about them, and they don't start with an immediate assumption of innocence. The other piece of it is trying to determine who is competent and who isn't. And so sometimes we assume that because a student comes from a poor family and a poor background, that they can't be as capable or they can't be as educated or they can't lead they can't be a leader in our community. And we make those assumptions when, in fact, uh, where you start or where family starts or the conditions or circumstances that a young person may find themselves are not necessarily the only predictors about their future. And when given opportunity and when given a chance, uh, they can uh, prove that they can lead. And when I look at the examples, for example, uh, at, at Lamorne Orange College, uh, the first black mayor and the first uh, black superintendent was Mayor W.W. W. Harrington. He's a graduate of Lamorne Orange College and had, and he, you know, he didn't necessarily come from a family of lots of college graduates, but he, he came to Lamorne Orange College and he was educated there. And he often says that Lamorne Orange College taught him about his own potential. There are people like uh, the Reverend Dr. Benjamin Hook, who, again, our Central Library is named after, but he uh, graduated from Lauren and College. He went on to become you know, the president of the National NAACP, and he was the first black appointed to the Federal uh, Communications Commission, the FCC, the first black in this nation. And even you know, locally, um, uh, Lois Beberry was the first uh, Senate pro tem at the Tennessee legislature. And even though we were a small college, we're overrepresented, in my opinion, or disproportionately represented in key leadership roles at the county commission, Mikhail Lowry and uh, Reginald Milton at the state legislature uh, for over 27 years, Larry Miller or um, Joe Towns. So even though we're small, we continue to show up in major leadership roles uh, throughout the city particularly in education, uh, particularly in the K-12 community where I come from, lots and lots and lots of teachers and principals in Memphis came through uh, Lamorne or in college uh, in their undergraduate experience. And I think we continue to see that uh, at, at disproportionate levels at the city and county level. And when you look nationally and look at doctors and lawyers and educators, uh, many leaders throughout the country, African-American leaders in particular, come from historically uh, black college, including the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. So yeah. I think that we have to keep reminding people that the importance of the historically black colleges in creating both leadership and opportunity for students who otherwise might not 
have had a chance, but also in contributing to the, you know, health and well-being of uh, our overall community. And we need to nurture that kind of leadership for the future if we're going to address these problems of inequality. Curious, um, you, well, you, you mentioned your background in education. You were, uh, many people will remember that you were superintendent of Shelby County. Well, it was then Memphis City Schools, correct? Um, I get my yes. name. Yeah. For, eight, <laughs> yeah. 12, 12, 12 years, 10 years, you were, you were. No, 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 actually it was a much more, it, it, it seems like it was a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was good to believe, really me. Uh, I was here for four years. Okay. And then um, I went to Boston. Um, uh, the late mayor, Thomas Menino, was the mayor and Boston is a city where the mayor uh, chooses the school board members and also chooses the superintendent. Wow. So I went from, uh, uh, you know, um, I, I was a mayor, um, Mayor Harrington was mayor here uh, when I was superintendent. And then I went to Boston and I was there for six years and then uh, came back where well, I guess seven years. And then I came back uh, to Memphis and I started working with um, a program that's called new leaders. And it's an opportunity to develop the leadership and talent for schools, uh, particularly underperforming schools. And um, I think that I believe strongly that um, it's important for our schools uh, to be strong and better, but we have to have uh, strong principals and principal leaders if we want parents to choose our schools and if we want um, teachers, great teachers to stay. Yeah. And so we worked very hard in, in, in focusing on uh, new leaders and developing the kind of leadership talent necessary to improve our uh, most needy uh, schools. So, yeah. um, And then I happened to be on the board of Lemoyne Orange College uh, when the trustees decided to make a change. And um, they asked me last August if I would act as interim president until they could find someone. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I agree to do that. I'm, I'm most of my career is not from higher ed, although I do teach a class once a year at Vanderbilt yeah. University in their body college. Yeah, I mean, you've had it was a year ago. We were talking a little bit last August, right? So you're coming up on one year. Yes, that is probably, yes. quite, quite a year um, in you know the history of Des Moines <laughs> and the history of the country. Um, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, it, it, co- so many questions, but w- one is. A, all colleges are facing an incredible challenge right now with, you know, colleges are at some level a business. Uh, they, they, they bring in revenue and they spend money on, on teachers and facilities and education. Um, how do you all look um, in terms of your incoming class and your returning class at a time when I assume you did online class, you did, you know, virtual learning in the, the latter part of the spring. And I assume you're planning virtual learning of some sort, some degree of virtual le- learning in the fall. How did how does the financial situ- situation look? So this is really the important question that we have been uh, dealing with uh, for the last few months. Um, our students went on spring break March 16th. Uh, the following week, we thought they were coming back, but we ended up on March 23rd doing training nonstop that week with all our faculty so that they could immediately transition to remote learning. And then the following week, all of our students were uh, learning remotely. And we had to work with students some to get them travel back to their home places. Uh, Many of our international students to find um, host families here because many of them did not want to leave the country at this critical time. And so I think that um, I'm proud of our faculty and the immediate way in which they made this transition. So we've been teaching remotely the spring semester. We had a remote graduation ceremony, and then uh, we continued remote for first and second summer session. Our second summer session will end uh, July 29th, and we've had students enroll throughout this period. Uh, We've had to provide, I think, the big challenge immediately in March. uh, We discovered that a lot of our students depended on our uh, computer labs on campus, or they went to the central library. When the Central Library closed and the campus closed uh, to students due to the pandemic, um, many students were struggling with technology access. So we had to quickly um, get computers ordered for all of our students that needed them. And then we had to work really hard to make sure they had internet or hotspot access. And uh, we worked with Comcast Essentials. We worked with uh, 
finding hot spots and 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 our work extended not just in Memphis but wherever we had students if they were some that we had a student in Nevada or we had a student in you know somewhere in Mississippi or Arkansas or in Illinois we had to support those students wherever they were and help them get the technology access so that they could finish the semester successfully or so they could uh, enroll in summer school uh, yeah. today we are beginning the plan to open college remotely initially uh, on August 12th. And uh, thanks to a partnership that we announced today, um, we have a partnership with um, Methodist Labana Healthcare. And they're helping us to set up a health and wellness center right on our campus so that as students return, we will be able to monitor the health situation, we'll do screenings, and we'll be able to see and make sure that uh, we're safe. But for now, we are on August 12th, we'll be uh, starting classes remotely. We have a partnership also with Microsoft Surface Laptop, where all of our new and returning students for the first time in the college's history will have a device so that they get a state-of-the-art device. And so all of our students will be remote on August 12th, and um, we will be ready to stay remote if we have to. Uh, you know, the situation is changing day to day. Uh, just this week, uh, the health department announced that there are a shortage of tests, and so they're reserving tests for only those uh, uh, individuals that are showing um, symptoms. And then there is a, a bottleneck in terms of getting test results back. And so while we uh, are going to be working very closely with Methodist uh, Labana Healthcare and um, uh, Dr. Mose, there, we are very excited about that partnership because in the past we've had students who got health care through uh, a fee they pay, a small fee that they've been paying, and they get it off campus. But they had to leave campus. Some of them didn't have transportation. It was much harder. But with this partnership, Labana uh, uh, Methodist Labana is really stepping up to the plate and saying we want to be partners with uh, Lamorna and College, and we want to help you provide the health care services. It's a three-year partnership. But it will provide a health clinic right on our campus with a uh, health care provider from Methodist Hospital. And we think that that will uh, add tremendous confidence to our efforts and will help families and students feel more comfortable. But because we are not sure yet what the trajectory and uh, I've been in contact with health department officials at the county. And what I've learned is that the um, percentage of positive tests uh, the percentages have been going up. They were at 4%, then they went to 14%. But for the population of students 18 to 34 years old, or the population of individuals 18 to 34 years old, the, the positive tests are at 22%. Well, that, wow. that, is, that is our population, 18 to yeah. 34 year olds. The other thing is, as you well know, um, the pandemic is having a disparate uh, impact on African-American uh, mm -hmm. families families in this community. And the death rate among uh, families it's a, uh, of African-American families um, is about, well, it's about 61% of all the deaths in Shelby County are uh, African-American families. And so um, we have to be even more sensitive uh, with the population that's 97% Black and also about 50% of our faculty uh, over the age of 50. For. So yeah. we are super sensitive to the disparate impact in our community and also the rate of positive tests that are coming back and also the delays in testing. But we're excited about the partnership with, because we believe that the disparities have always existed and this partnership with Methodist Alabama uh, will, uh, will not be just about the COVID um, pandemic, even though it's coming at a very critical time. But it's about the long-term health and well-being and safety of people in this community who may be poor, may be black, but who need additional support to be connected to quality yeah. health care uh, for a lifetime. All right. We will. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but we, uh, we will leave it there on that, that very positive note. Again, uh, congratulations on, on the, the big uh, gift to Lemoyne and to the endowment there. Um, thanks for joining us, Carol. Thank you so much. We look forward to a great school year.
Yes. And uh, be sure to subscribe to The Daily Memphian on the site for unlimited articles. Subscribe to this weekly podcast and our other Daily Memphian podcasts, including behind the headlines, shows on, on politics, sports, food, and more. All the podcasts are on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, and join us again next week. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.